Hey everybody and welcome to the One Wildlife Podcast with me, Abby Barnes. This is simply a show about life and as such there are no boundaries to where our conversations can take us. Along the way we simply aim to inspire, empower, educate and uplift, exploring how we can all live our best lives every single day. Before we get started, I want to mention that this podcast is hosted by Spend More Time in the Wild, which I founded in 2016 to help individuals get outside for the benefit of mental and physical health. Over the last few years, the project has grown into a worldwide community of passionate and courageous individuals working together to enjoy the beauty of our wild spaces and protect them for generations to come. You can find out more about both the podcast and wild by visiting www.spendmoretimeinthewild.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening or head on to YouTube to watch the full episode. James Forrest is a British adventurer, hiker and author. Nicknamed Mountain Man by the Sunday Telegraph, James has set several hill walking records, including climbing all of the 1001 mountains across the UK and Ireland between 2017 and 2019. During this challenge, he walked more than 5,000 kilometres, climbed the height of Everest 30 times and slept wild under the stars for over 100 nights. He has since completed the National Three Peaks by foot, walking 500 miles in just 16 days, along the way creating his heartfelt and empowering documentary, The Mountain Inside, following his mental health journey. He has also walked the Dales Way, Pembrokeshire Coastal Pass, the West Highland Way and Wainwrights Coast to Coast, to name but a few. But it hasn't always been like this for James though. From the age of 20 to 30, He was based in inner city Birmingham, holding down a 40 hour work week in the charity sector. It was in 2016 though, that James decided to hand in his notice, sell his house and go traveling. And this was the catalyst for all he has achieved today. Along the way, James has inspired many by writing articles and sharing his story across his popular Instagram account. And today, we're lucky enough to speak with James to dive in a little bit deeper to his adventurous nature and find out what really makes him tick. So, James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. How are you doing today? You're based up in Cumbria, right? I am. Yeah, I'm really good. Um, uh, Nice to chat to you. I've watched all your videos on YouTube, so... Uh, nice to finally meet you. Absolutely. Well, listen, I feel like there's so much we could um, pick apart here. I'm, I'm very interested in, in you as a person and your outdoor endeavours. But um, one thing that really jumps out for me there in that that introduction that I read out is that, you know, you sort of started uh, life in inner city, city Birmingham. And I'm, I'm interested to know what were you doing there sort of in, in the career world? And how did that morph to you wanting to sell your house and go traveling? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'd i always loved um, spending time outside as a kid. So kind of that love for the outdoors had been kind of part of me from a young age. I, I grew up in Birmingham, uh, but my grandparents were ramblers. Uh, so they took me and my little brother out hiking like every weekend. So I'd kind of really um, had that seed of a, a kind of love for the outdoors from a young age. But after I left university and I kind of felt all those societal pressures to get a good job and, and get a house and get a car and start climbing all these ladders that society says you need to climb. Um, and so I kind of settled into this life at, uh, in Birmingham. I had a, had a job in the charity sector. It was, a, it was a pretty good job, but effectively I was just working in an office, sending lots of emails, going to lots of meetings, chained to a laptop um and just kind of sat behind a desk for you know 40 hours a week and then I was just kind of living in a city and hanging out in a city during uh the weekends and kind of ended up accidentally living this kind of very office centric and city centric existence and still kind of retain that little bit of a love for the outdoors at we uh, sometimes at weekends and holidays traveling up to the lake district and uh snowdonia and places like that but kind of accidentally fallen into this life that i didn't really kind of 
enjoy that much. And I'd always envisaged as a younger boy that I'd live a more outdoorsy, more adventurous, more exciting existence than just sending 4,732 emails every week. So, uh, so it's kind of, uh, so I eventually sort of figured out or, or, or kind of plucked up the courage and bravery to try and change that back in 2016. So in a nutshell, that's my kind of background, really. Mm. So when you were, were a kid going out with your grandparents, sort of hiking and things, did it sort of consciously register that this was something you really enjoyed? Um, oh, it's kind of difficult to, to look back now. I, I knew that I loved being active, so... I loved being kind of outside. I loved being sporty. I loved being active. In much of my kind of like younger life, I generally sort of channeled that energy into playing sports. So I played loads of sport as a kid and as a teenager. Um, so playing lots of team sports and individual sports. Um, and that kind of gave me what I needed um, to kind of stay <laughs> happy and sane and, and what have you. But but, and I always knew that I loved going walking and spending time outside when I did have that opportunity. But I guess it didn't come around that often living in a city and going to school in a city. And, you know, my whole life was kind of based in in Birmingham, where, where I grew up. So, so I knew that I loved it, but I didn't, I don't really know, I guess, for a long period of time, how you could make your life more adventurous or more outdoorsy. I didn't quite know what career paths you could take I didn't quite sort of grasp that I had a choice to live somewhere else other than in a city and um and yes it just took took me the way it worked for me is it took quite a long time to kind of figure it out and figure out my own my own path to kind of uh, where I am today Mm. no that's, that's fair enough and I think it's it's very interesting, isn't it, how we can look back on these things and see how they've shaped us, but sort of during the time you're just in the experience and I suppose that's the joy of being a child, isn't it? <laughs> so <laughs> when you say you you went travelling, you sort of quit your job, sold your house and you went travelling, did you sort of just mm-hmm. end up where the wind blew you or was it a bit more structured than that? Um, so back in 2016, I kind of, uh, yeah, took six months travelling and um, it was a bit like a kind of gap year, aged um age 30 rather than 20 so I didn't have a gap year when I was 20 and yeah went traveling for six months went to New Zealand and Australia and through Southeast Asia uh did loads of trekking in New Zealand I went to Tasmania as well where there's just some absolutely incredible trails that I did out there um and kind of had this quite planned kind of six months of traveling around an adventure and then when I got back to UK, I actually went to a, did a work away, which is where you kind of volunteer and live somewhere and did that on a farm in the Lake District for six months. So that was my kind of year off. And so it's quite structured and quite planned. Um, but as I look back on it now, it was kind of like boom or bust. It kind of like I'd been living uh, I'd just been working and living a normal life for ages. Then I just go and splurge a hell of a load of money uh, on, on sort of 12 months away. And it wasn't really like sustainable. It was kind of, it was amazing and hedonistic and exciting and adventurous for that, that year, but it wasn't sustainable. Um, there's no way that I could kind of um, keep traveling the world because I just didn't have enough money to do that. So I kind of spent after that, I kind of was really grappling with this concept of how can I have as much adventure and and outdoorsy time and excitement as I did in that gap year, but around a a kind of more normal existence and around a job and um, how can you kind of, yeah, integrate the two. So that was, that's the kind of journey that, that I sort of ended up on. So the kind of gap year was amazing, but it kind of, pushed me and taught me to try and figure out a way to make it a bit more sustainable and a bit more realistic um, and something that you can make more integral to your life for the next five years or the next 10 years or the the rest of your life sort of a thing so that's the journey I've been on since since then. Absolutely so before we come to that journey um, I'm, I'm curious to know 
you know, when we travel and we see these vast landscapes and we explore different cultures, quite often they can really bring us big learnings and teachings. And I wonder whether during that time, whether international or the six months in the UK, you sort of discovered anything about yourself that perhaps you hadn't realised before? Yeah, um, I mean, I think one thing that I definitely learned was that in the kind of like everyday life and in work life, certainly, I personally can be a bit of a kind of overthinker. I can get myself stressed and, and kind of um, anxious and worked up quite easily. And then in this kind of modern world as well, getting kind of bombarded constantly with social media and emails and phone calls and life's just so kind of hectic and I always felt this kind of like detachment from all of that when I was outside I was able to kind of switch off from it and kind of just center myself and find a bit more equilibrium and just just calm and and relax and realize that all these things I'm getting worked up about aren't really that important at the end of the day and always felt a kind of sense of like walking and spending time outdoors had a kind of element of therapy and and kind of yeah healing I guess in a sense uh, and a sense of escapism for me escapism from the kind of hecticness of everyday life so kind of really learned that for sure but not in a way that I kind of like really grasped it straight away I kind of like it took me something that I've kind of dealt with over a long period of time and kind of Certainly, even the last few years, I've learned more. And as you mentioned, with that documentary that I put out about mental health, that it's kind of been a sort of ongoing learning process and a journey rather than didn't suddenly kind of <laughs> work out how to, you know, look after my own mental health and be as happy as I could be just by going for one walk. It's just been a kind of a longer kind of journey and that's just the way it was for me and that kind of worked out work worked in that way for me and so so yeah kind of um kind of takes time and sometimes takes a bit more bravery and a bit more kind of I don't know courage to kind of address things or what have you but um but but yeah the I've always I've always kind of felt that my travels have taught me how much the outdoors means to me and how much it, it helps me to kind of cope with the challenges everyday life kind of throws up really. Mm. No, that's brilliant. I, I resonate a fair bit with that as well. And I'm sure many of the listeners will do. So you've had your six months in the Lake District. How did that morph into you then climbing all 1001 mountains in the UK? <laughs> um well, I didn't initially set off to climb the 1001. I kind of had, came up with this idea in 2017 to try and do the Nuttles, which are uh, this list of uh, all the hills over 2,000 feet in England and Wales. And they're named after the two authors, John and Anne Nuttall. And that's what I decided I was going to try and do in 2017 as my attempt to cram as much adventure into my life around my everyday job and uh, to kind of go out wild camping and explore new national parks I'd never been to and just have a kind of awesome mountain adventure and it was my attempt to try and kind of not be depressed that my gap year was over and <laughs> that all the fun was kind of like in the past I wanted to kind of look forward and have something really exciting to do um, and that kind of accidentally set me off on this kind of three-year mission to do the 1001 mountains which so I started off in England and Wales in 2017 uh, then I went to Ireland in in 2018 for another peak bagging mission and and then felt like I had to go to Scotland to do the Munros in 2019 to to finish it all and uh, it was just a real quirk of mathematics as well that they added up to 1001 that wasn't kind of and that's just the way it worked out so that was quite kind of <laughs> quite a nice uh, number to to finish on um but basically it was this 
mission to kind of explore as much of the UK as I could to prove that you could have loads of adventure around a relatively normal existence around a, around a job and that you didn't have to travel that far or spend that much money or be, you know, some sort of total professional adventure to have a, a adventurer to have a really kind of amazing uh, outdoorsy experience. And so in some ways I, I proved that, you know, I went to some totally amazing places in the UK and, and, you know, the previous year or what have you, I'd traveled halfway across the world to try and get that, that fix of, ad, of ad, adventure adrenaline, but actually it was closer to home and you didn't have to spend a fortune and, and kind of quit a job and sell a house to actually experience that. You can do it on your doorstep. And that was quite a, quite a kind of powerful and wonderful thing to, to learn. No, a hundred percent. And I feel, you know, with the, the, the situation we've had with COVID and the lockdown and people not being able to travel, so many focus sort of coined onto this, that the UK is stunning. There is so much for, for everybody, um, mm-hmm. you know, but I wonder, were there any particular high points and low points during these, these few years, anything that really stands out for you that you had to push through or that just was really worthy of celebration? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Oh, I mean, there's so many highs and so many lows. It's almost like living a kind of, uh, yeah, going on this real sort of roller coaster. The, the the lows feel quite crushing and the highs feel quite euphoric. So it's, it's kind of really re, re, sort of from one extreme to the other. Um, and, yeah, it was often really just kind of linked to the weather. So <laughs> I felt like the, the weather would had sort of complete control over my own uh happiness effectively during these these years so if it was if the weather gods were kind to me and I was out you know wild camping in Scotland or in the Lake District or the Pennines or Snowdonia or wherever um I was living living the dream you know like waking up to a beautiful sunset uh boiling up some porridge just like all on my own just fresh air great views kind of that that sense of freedom you get from the open trail and life was good then it was amazing uh if it was torrential rain and blowing a gale and uh and I was sort of plodding over these lonely desolate hills all by myself soaked to the bone then I was thinking my God, I've made some terrible life decisions. What on earth am I doing? <laughs> so it's kind of really, really uh, ups and downs. And even though I was kind of, kind of relatively experienced in the mountains at those times, I did learn a lot during those years. I'd kind of, you know, I'd, I'd been wild camping and done different trails before. I'd walked all the Wainwrights before, but I'd never done anything quite this hardcore. It's a real kind of like, step up um in kind of difficulty and um distances and all the rest of it and so I went through quite a kind of steep learning curve uh one moment that I always talk about was when I was in the Brecon Beacons and I was wild camping and my tent sort of collapsed in this like horrendous storm and I like woke up in what was effectively like a swamp and I just absolute sort of how not to go wild camping kind of a thing uh so I was just like everything was muddy I was soaked uh and it literally just 4am I just like packed up and walked out I was exhausted just went to the nearest like 24-hour McDonald's and sort of tried to reassess my my like life or (laughs) whatever um while eating a you know sausage McMuffin or whatever and drinking a latte but uh but yeah, so th- there was some real kind of lows and some real kind of uh, big learning curves. and uh, uh, But that was kind of what was really good as well. Like I wasn't one of these people that was, uh, I didn't have like a mountain leaders qualification. I hadn't gone through, hadn't grown up in a family of adventurers. I hadn't been like highly skilled mountaineer and, you know, I hadn't been introduced to these things as it, massively as a young kid I was just kind of really just 
hopefully proving that with like anyone with a bit of grit and determination and love for the outdoors can can kind of follow their adventure dreams and of course you want to do it safely and and responsibly and all the rest of it but but kind of especially because my interest is hill walking like hill walking is very accessible like anyone can get into it and I think that's that's kind of something really great and anyone out there that is thinking about doing the West Highland Way or wanting to walk the Wainwrights or got these kind of adventure dreams anyone can really give it a go and and uh and hopefully that's what I proved through some of these adventures mm, I love that message you know again really poignant and uh, I think the outdoor world quite often can become almost quite like commercialized. You know, you have to have this kit, you have to have these qualifications, you have to know these people in order to get out and have an awesome experience. But it's just simply not true. You know, as you say, so long as you're safe and you know what you're doing, um, then, yeah, you can have have an awesome time. Um, yeah, I'm interested, yeah. actually, when you were you were getting out doing this this challenge over the sort of the three years that it, it amassed to um first of all do you know how many days you were actually out in the hills and secondly was the weather ever an obstacle because having had a lot of fun thoroughly stalking you through your instagram account it seems that the weather isn't necessarily the biggest barrier for you you just get out uh is that a true statement or am i missing something there and um, <laughs> yeah well i did walk, certainly did walk through a lot of rain um i kind of became a little bit obsessed I, I I think I sort of maybe became a little bit of a like slave to these lists of hills that I was trying to do so that is kind of something every adventurer has to kind of think about or anyone a, anyone going on an adventure is kind of uh your goals that you have um versus like being flexible and reacting to the the conditions that, that you're you're dealt so I kind of basically was just like I'm doing doing this come hell or high water and therefore I was if it was raining I'm still walking and if it's stormy I'm still walking and had a little bit of flexibility but I was on such a kind of uh crazy schedule to try and get all these mountains done that I just just kept going no matter what um and that kind of approach isn't for everyone um I kind of in some ways because I love the exercise and I love the challenge and I get a kind of buzz from the other aspects of walking that for me that worked for other people. Um, if it, for you, it's all about the views and the, the kind of spiritual kind of aspect of, of being out in the mountains, then, then like taking a slow approach and just not going out in the rain is far more sensible. Um, I mean, I can't say that I particularly enjoyed many of those days, um uh and so yeah I kind of uh I think everyone ba what was odd was that everyone seemed to really enjoy following it on Instagram the more it rained and the more I was suffering the more everyone seemed to enjoy it I think there was a kind of like element of schadenfreude about sort of following some of my adventures so um so I hope people <laughs> kind of like uh um enjoyed the the sort of jokes and the the sort of uh I, I basically started pretending that I enjoyed rain even though I never really <laughs> did <laughs> that was a kind of ongoing ongoing joke so the whole sort of fake it till you make it thing have you made it but yeah exactly <laughs> uh so then you went on and did the three peaks but not in the conventional way not in the 24 hour mm -hmm. way um so for listeners who you know perhaps might be outside of the uk um the three peaks is the three highest peaks within mainland britain so we've got ben nevis we've got scarfer pike and we've got snowdonia you didn't just go and walk the mountains you decided to walk between the mountains as well talk us through yeah. that grand adventure yeah so basically uh, obviously i've gone through the quite a few years of doing these peak bagging trips and climbing different mountains and it'd been amazing and i'd loved it it'd been really really tough it had been like i said these kind of real highs and real lows but kind of at the end of it i'd almost maybe had um maybe you can have too much of a good thing and i was kind of a little bit jaded with these kind of projects of marching around going up and down so many different mountains um so last year i got into kind of doing longer trails like just classic long distance trails and 
really that kind of rejuvenated me and sort of rekindled my outdoors mojo and I really started loving those and because they're a bit flatter they're these kind of like a to b walks um it was like a different style and and I was really really loving it and so I did quite a few of those in the spring and early summer um and was loving it and then I just had this idea to to do the the three peaks and um I'd never actually done it in the sort of traditional way which is to drive between the three peaks and try and climb them all within 24 hours um but always from quite a young age known about it and thought one day I'll do that um but but then I kind of had these two motivations to, to do it on foot instead so one was that I'd started really loving these long distance trails and kind of wanted to do my own bit more kind of unique and bespoke long distance trail and then secondly I knew that this kind of driving the three peaks uh challenge was has kind of a lot of pitfalls it's quite bad for the environment you just kind of a bit mercenary going into the an, an environment um often late at night beasting up the hill back down and out again and it kind of um, not wanting to sort of kind of belittle the challenge, but it has a bit of a bad reputation, the the kind of normal National Three Peaks. So I thought maybe I can kind of do it in a more environmentally kind of responsible way and do it all on foot and have this kind of big adventure and um, and manage to do it in kind of just over 16 days. So that was amazing. Uh, I, I absolutely loved it. It was what was different was that I went through a lot of urban areas. So I kind of the scenery was an always like incredible mountains. I was walking past very industrial landscapes and big cities and coastline. And it was really varied, but kind of found that I just kind of some ways, one thing I like about walking is just that slow pace and kind of seeing life go by and you're able to take a lot in and, by going through this kind of breadth of different landscapes, I was able to get a kind of real broad impression and feeling of the, of the UK. And that was kind of really nice. It wasn't just kind of remote, lonely mountains. It was a bit of everything. Um, and so, so it was, it was another great challenge. And I've kind of realized that I'm enjoying variety, like doing different things can, can kind of bring something different. You don't, that I don't have to stay and do the same types of adventures year after year, kind of uh, feel like I'm evolving a little bit and my personal preferences are changing a little bit. So uh, either that or I just enjoyed the fact that I could go to Nando's and, <laughs> <laughs> and get, get a coffee uh, every now and then or whatever because I was going through cities. It is a treat to be able to pick something up on the way. I have to agree with you there. There's a there's a while of being wet in the rain and carrying heavy stuff that you're like, okay, let's just take a breather. <laughs> so you did you complete this this route in 16 days and you shot the documentary The Mountain Inside, um, which is a 20 minute film up on YouTube, and I've watched it a few times around and I just find it really really very empowering. It's very honest. It's a beautifully made film following your journey. And you, you know, you, you really open up, I sort of believe for the first time in a bit more depth mm -hmm. about your journey with, with mental health. Would you mind sharing mm -hmm. a little bit about that here today? Yeah, of course. So, um, so kind of effectively in the, the film kind of tell the story of my own journey um, with my own mental health through the kind of lens of that that trip and that journey so it's kind of more broadly about my my kind of I guess my life over the last five years ten years rather than just specifically that 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 trip um but I kind of open up and just say that I was kind of diagnosed by my GP of having low level depression um and I and, and that was back in sort of late 2020 and um, was um, prescribed antidepressants which I've been taking ever since then and kind of I guess it was something I'd known about or felt like I was grappling with for a long time um, I just generally had this kind of slightly negative mindset 
couldn't kind of find that balance of happiness that I guess everyone wants to kind of have in life. And I think I'd always been in some ways kind of self-medicating with the outdoors and in, and kind of finding that relief by spending time outside. But I'd never kind of really gone through the process of kind of going to the GP and for, and trying to kind of get some some sort of medical help for it and um so I just kind of open up about that and talk about the fact that that's what I did and that that has really helped me over the last few few years and also I guess kind of point out that in some ways like the outdoors was always there for me and to help me but it wasn't necessarily like a a sort of magic wand to to kind of like fix things and sometimes maybe you do need to kind of combine your love for the outdoors and spending time outdoors with getting some more professional help or, or some medication or what have you and um and so yeah that's what what I talk about and I guess like some of these issues as well for me were linked with going through like uh, a marriage breakdown and kind of a lot of big changes in my life in quite a short period of time so moving away from Birmingham where all my family and support network was kind of quitting my job moving house as well as this relationship breakdown like that's a lot of kind of things that are going on in a short period of time that can that is very kind of unsettling and can lead to you know anxiety or 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 kind of unhappiness and those sort of things so so kind of like, yeah, I just, just really felt that I learned that the outdoors is brilliant for me and is one kind of string to the bow of trying to kind of find more happiness. But it doesn't have to be like, as I say, a magic wand to fix everything instantly. And it doesn't, uh, and, and like seeking other help alongside that can, can only be a good thing and maybe maybe like hopefully that message resonated with other people. And I certainly know lots of other people have said to me that, you know, they enjoyed the documentary. They have gone through something similar or they've, they're thinking about doing something or what have you. So, uh, so yeah, it was kind of, uh, it was great to put that out there and the response was great. And, and sometimes like talking about mental health can be a little bit, kind of daunting but actually the response was overwhelmingly kind of supportive and and wonderful so that was yeah, a great that's, experience that's exactly where I was gonna gonna um, jump in to ask XD like was it easy for you to share your story um or was that a sort of a bit of a vulnerability hangover afterwards yeah I mean it definitely was a bit of a there was a bit of a sort of vulnerability hangover I guess and that it was a bit daunting to do it and part of me there's a part of me that didn't want to do it and didn't feel sort of comfortable doing it. But then basically I, I, what I was worried about was that because for me, this was generally, it was generally all kind of like low level depression. It wasn't, it's not, I'm not like in crisis. So there's not something kind of like exceptionally extreme, but it is preventing me from being like happy in an everyday life. And I was worried that it might come across as being a bit, attention seeking or might seem like why should I talk about this when other people are going through more have got more difficult lives or more extreme are going through crisis or whatever um but I, I spoke to my friend Harrison who's uh uh he, he's like fell foodie on Instagram and he's he's uh um speaks amazingly about his own journey from kind of being an alcoholic and having suicidal thoughts and then kind of changing his life and, and battling his own demons. And I spoke to him and I said, like, what do you think? Should I, should I do this documentary about uh, mental health or not? And I'm worried about it coming across like this or that. And then, but then he said like, Oh, but that is exactly why people don't talk about those worries. I was having is exactly why people won't, talk to their mom and dad or won't talk to their friends or won't talk to their partners about mental health because they're worried about how it comes across so if you if you sort of succumb to those worries then that is that is exactly why 
some people bottle everything up and don't don't share it or don't seek help. So that suddenly when he said that, I was like, oh, I, I, that proves that I like should definitely talk about it. And it doesn't matter that it's not perhaps at the sort of extreme end of of kind of like mental health issues. And um, and so he was a real big help with that. And that was really kind of interesting to think about it in that way. And so so and also I kind of found that the sometimes it's kind of more worrying in the build-up and then you do it and then you look back and think oh what was I worrying about it is actually fine to talk about it wasn't that big an obstacle to get over in the end so that was that was my experience no I I I hear you with all of that you know I I I try and share as much as I can um or feels comfortable sort of with my own mental health journey and there's always a bit of vulnerability but no I I really want to thank you for creating that film because I I just think it's very powerful and inspirational for people and as you mentioned you know already folk are commenting on yeah sort of similar experience or a parallel experience and just getting outside is definitely part of the the medicine that that can be sought out so yeah thank you for that um yeah I'm, I'm interested actually uh to know how you get through the harder days that you come up against whether outside or just in day-to-day life yeah um I mean in the outdoors certainly I've I think what what's worked well for me is that I've always managed to kind of get myself into quite a kind of blinkered mindset so I've always been quite kind of like determined and focused and because I've played st- quite a lot of serious sport throughout my childhood and as a like a young adult I guess I've got that kind of like sporty determination within me and I can kind of go to that place and that helps me sort of battle through the hard times certainly in the outdoors um and just kind of like focus on the goal and just become a bit of a sort of like robotic hiker just like determined to get to the finish line um besides that it's kind of, I guess, useful to like chunk things, to think about things in small chunks and bite-sized chunks rather than the whole journey. So sometimes it can feel overwhelming if you think, blimey, I've got 300 miles to go. But if you think, oh, I'm just going to walk five miles and then I'm going to have lunch, then that doesn't seem quite as bad. Um, And... (laughs) uh so yeah and then just focusing on little kind of rewards and like food is an amazing motivator when you're on a trail so just like you know um kind of celebrating little things and and having rewards of whatever chocolates or sweets or cakes you want to eat then then that's kind of really good um and one thing I did on the on the three peaks I actually started listening to like comedy podcasts on the like days where it's raining all day and basically what I, what I thought was that actually on some of my other challenges if it's like gray and dreary and rainy you can't see anything and then you can just get into a mindset where you're sort of slightly spiraling downhill so you're thinking oh this is boring I'm so wet I'm cold like I've got so long to go I'm gonna have to go walking tomorrow and you kind of like mindset is spiraling negatively but i basically used comedy podcasts which make me laugh and make me smile to trick my mind into thinking that i was you know having a fun experience and that that kind of helped me through some of the like more difficult days and that was just like a little trick that i sort of tried and it worked pretty well for me um i I often like to like without music or whatever but if it's just raining and cloudy, then it seemed like a sensible solution. So, what was your go-to show to listen to? <laughs> well, I was listening to um, there's a podcast called Atletico Mint, which is uh, which is a weird name, but it's by um, uh, it's by like Bob Mortimer, the comedian, um, yeah. and he's like so zany and kind of off the wall <laughs> that um, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but um, basically had me in hysterics uh, as I was like walking uh, <laughs> walking along the Loch Lomond path and things like that during my three peaks so so uh so Bob Bob Mortimer helped me along the trail basically <laughs> Good old Bob. I'll have to look that one up I think yeah. so one of the things I've I've really picked up on 
with you is you hike light and you hike fast um you've mm -hmm. mentioned sort of your sporting background so it seems that you're a pretty fit chap um where does sort of getting the base weight pack weight down come from you and the almost speed walking as well i mean you certainly know how to cover some distance in a day mm -hmm. i mean uh yeah i guess i guess having that kind of like sporty background and that sporty kind of approach to hiking has always been my style and i quite quite like that having said that it's it's not for everyone and i don't uh, and i'm certainly don't ever try and sort of portray this thing that like the longer that you walk or the faster or, or further you walk the better your experience is like for many people if you go a bit slower you've got more time to kind of relax sit on a bench take in the views stop in a cafe for a while like that is completely fine and and really great and great and perfect for some people so um even though i kind of take on these fast adventures um fast hiking adventures it's not necessarily for everyone um obviously fast hiking is still way way slower than like all the crazy trail runners so like everything is kind of like relative some hikers think i'm really fast then i think all these like total lunatics who like run the uh <laughs> pennine way in three days or whatever they do it in uh i think so and, and they probably look at the like world's best trail runners as being really fast so everything is kind of always in these levels and always kind of uh relative in terms of going light that's something that i've kind of developed over the last few years and um certainly worked well for me in like spring and summer and um is less easy to do in winter when you need more warmth from your kit and more protection and all the rest of it but yeah, I, I kind of really love doing it that way in in spring and summer. And it's really nice to for your back not to be aching and to feel kind of like agile and nimble and kind of uh, not restricted when you're walking. If I walked past someone with a massive 65 litre, 50, 15 kilogram backpack, I know that during the day I'm more comfortable and having a more positive experience as we're hiking but then at night that person is going to be warmer and cozier and probably more comfortable than me um so it's kind of like this this balancing act and there's a point that you get to where it's the point of diminishing uh like the point of diminishing returns sort of a thing so you can go lighter and lighter and lighter but potentially means you're just sort of sacrificing on more and more comfort and the like I was joking the other day where I was saying like the inevitable conclusion is that you just don't carry any kit and just like <laughs> lie in a ditch to sleep or whatever <laughs> with no People's sleep. People's idea of fun. <laughs> but um, but there's, I feel like there is a sweet spot for everyone and, and kind of going lighter is is really great and it can help you to enjoy the walking more, suffer from less aches and pains and maybe less blisters and um and it's about kind of figuring it out for each person but it but it can really be done and it's just often just a matter of i guess often getting slightly more expensive lightweight kit mm. unfortunately the lighter the kit is generally the more expensive it is um and then also just not doing that thing where you take loads of stuff just in case you need it yeah. um so so on my more recent trips it's just like anything that was like a just in case kind of a an item i just didn't take um and and that helped save absolutely loads of weight so you've got to be quite rigid with yourself sometimes haven't you <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah you basically just no spare underwear that's the main rule i think if you're trying absolutely. to become an ultra light <laughs> just have to like throw personal hygiene out of the window and just you really do it's, it's so true yeah. front back inside out <laughs> yeah, or exactly. just don't bother <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah it's it's tricky I, I can remember on my three peaks trip i was just like in the same t-shirt that i've been wearing for about like something stupid like 10 days 
and then I went to I was staying in a travel lodge and I went to like this uh, pizza restaurant next door <laughs> and there's this like young couple who look like they're on like a first date like having this kind of like romantic pizza meal or this, this Italian meal and then I was there like <laughs> just in my hiking kit in this 10 day old t-shirt looking like a sort of uh disheveled uh whatever <laughs> disheveled kind of person and uh yeah that was that I'm sure I'll probably ruin their date basically it was a bit <laughs> embarrassing <laughs> uh, sometimes you just got to own the experience though side question yeah. what's the longest you've gone without a shower oh blimey um so the longest was when I did the Wainwrights in um uh, in 2020 and that was like 14 days well yeah 15 days mm, so impressive impressive quite long. <laughs> so, for, yeah. so for the for the gear junkies then could you quickly run us through what you take um sort of to fill the base weight of your pack yeah so let me think so for the for the three peaks walk for example that's a good example so I was carrying a frameless backpack. So it's like a really light backpack, the kind of like through hiking style backpacks that you can get from American brands. Um, so I had uh, I had a, a really light backpack. Um, in there, I had my Gossamer Gear tent, which is um, like a single skin tent and it uses your trekking poles um, to to kind of erect it. So it's it it doesn't have its own pole so that's pretty lightweight it's about 500 grams had a lightweight but pretty war as warm as possible sleeping bag had a um yeah ph designs sleeping bag which is like really warm for the le- lowest weight possible thermo rest uber light sleeping mat so that was kind of like my my basic kind of like camping equipment was as light as possible uh then I basically had the clothes that I was hiking in, which is like lightweight synthetic um, clothing, uh, kind of like trainer-like boots, uh, like the Innovate Rock Flies I was wearing, um, which are like which are great for through hiking. They're like non non Gore Tex, so that was my sort of preference. So that they they'll get wet if it if it rains but they dry out so quickly and what i found with on longer distance walks sometimes the gore-tex boots can be once you get them wet then you're just never going to get them dry Uh, so it's kind of becomes a bit self-defeating so those boots were great for me and then uh, then what else did i have in my backpack just like my waterproofs a down jacket first aid kit few kind of spare spare little things but really not very much at all and then just just my food and I didn't take a stove as well so I went mm. stoveless for those trips so I was either soaking. I was doing a little bit of cold soaking and then just eating as I went along and just often just having like cold dinners like you know, like pasta or sandwiches or things like that. So, um, so that kind of saved, uh, saved quite a bit of weight as well. So. Mm. See, I've, I've, I'm not sure I feel about the whole no stove thing. So I quite like the, mm. the warmth. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I mean, what I can tell everyone is that like cold soaking a meal is like pretty, pretty awful <laughs> it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't taste particularly good or i haven't found a meal that works well as a cold soaking yet um so so you you really are like basically just eating to survive rather than enjoy and and if i go out camping where i'm just going out for one night i'll take a stove and can have a hot chocolate in the evening and a nice hot meal and that for your morale and your kind of general experience that is pretty 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 important uh but sometimes i sort of sacrifice those things and and uh, <laughs> uh, and just prioritize the like minimizing the weight of my backpack 
Totally. Just Pre- probably just becoming more and more of a deranged <laughs> ultra <ultralight laughs> You're I, selling it, James. You're selling it. <laughs> yeah. Basically, someone told me the other day that there's this new thing, which is where people, as they walk, put their like meals in their crotch oh, wow. to like to sort of like so like your body heat. <laughs> oh, sort wow. of like heated meal, like crotch heated meals. Sorry, if that's a bit of a sort of graphic and disgusting thought, but um, but I was like, that that's a whole other level. Of, I haven't tried that yet. So yeah, with the whole like not changing underwear thing. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no combo, yeah. All right. Well, I expect a full report back after your next adventure, please. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> Uh, well, you have also, amongst all of this, written a book, um, The Mountain Man. Yeah. How did you find the writing experience? Um, yeah, it was a real mix. I I absolutely loved it. I loved kind of revisiting my adventure, sort of reliving the adventure almost and, and kind of putting down my my thoughts and my experiences and and, and kind of in some ways it was a, it was quite an enjoyable and therapeutic process. On the flip side, it's a lot of hard work. And if writer's block ever kicked in, then it feels like really quite an arduous and frustrating process. So it's kind of a, a bit of a mix. And it was a, you know, a lot of hard work ultimately, but something that I felt really, really proud of having done. And and kind of when you get that first copy of the book and you see, see it and hold it in your hands, that's kind of a really proud moment. So kind of really pleased that I've that I managed to do it and hopefully I'll find the time to maybe do another one again in the future uh and and yeah people seem to have enjoyed it and have had a good response to it so pretty pretty kind of pleased pleased overall that I've done it oh no it's it's an amazing I haven't actually um managed to read it yet but I want to pick up my coffee and uh dive in because I love a good book well as we begin to to wrap this thing up I'd I really love to sort of leave the listeners with perhaps some sort of tips and advice to get outside you know whatever their Mm -hmm. backgrounds um or experience or skills level um what would you sort of say to them to help them enjoy some adventures within 2022 yeah um okay what would I say um well based on my experience I th- I think it's kind of really great if you kind of give yourself a bit of structure to your adventures or a bit of a goal or a bit of a mission and it doesn't have to be something like really crazily wild or crazily ambitious but having something that kind of gives you a bit of a motivation is really good Mm -hmm. so for me I've always been motivated by like oh I'm going to try and do this list of mountains or I'm going to try and walk this trail or something to give you a bit of a kick up the bum and make you get outside so um, even on those days where it's a bit rainy or a bit tricky or you might bail on bail on it so just doing something like it could be anything people can come up with their own idea could be like I know a lot of people do this like walk a thousand miles in the year Mm. challenge like that's a brilliant example of something simple that can motivate you and kind of push you to do more or it could be oh I'm going to try and do the Wainwright Hills in the Lake District or it could be I'm going to have 12 adventurous weekends in the year one a month or it could be I'm going to try and explore my local area more or just a little bit of a sort of mission I think is really good at kind of like giving you motivation so that would be my little tip that's cool I like the the one adventure a month thing that's that's slightly different approach that's cool so speaking Mm -hmm. of missions what's 2022 looking like for you um well I haven't uh haven't got any concrete plans as of yet I kind of generally I'm a bit more at home and take things a bit more chilled and, and kind of relaxed during the winter when the weather's not quite as good and the days aren't as long. Um, but I think I'm going to try and do some more long distance trails like like I did in in 2021. So nothing planned as of yet, but I've got my eye on quite like to do the Sky Trail on the Isle of Skye, maybe uh, thinking about uh, what else am I thinking about? Uh, yeah, 
some other trails in Scotland, maybe like John Muir Trail. Maybe if I can go to the Alps, I'd would love to do like a, a week or two's trail in the Alps, but haven't been abroad for a few years. So just see how it goes with COVID or whatever. Um, so yeah, just kind of watch this space. Definitely going to be out hiking, doing some big, big trips. Uh, just haven't quite, quite decided yet. So Very too many options. Though. <laughs> oh, so many options. Yeah, you're telling me. Well, we look forward yeah. to, to following along on your, your Instagram platform for sure. Well, we like to wrap up these episodes with our 10 quick fire questions. My, my questions are quick, but your answers don't have to be. Are you ready to jump right in? Go for it, yeah. All right, let's do it. So first question, what was the last book that you read and loved? Last book I read and loved? Um, well... <laughs> I'm I, I'm looking at my bookshelf. I I I love reading like uh, well. Currently, I'm reading like a Jack Reacher novel, which is by Lee Child, which is like really trashy kind of a um, thriller. So I'm not going to say that. I, I absolutely loved um, the Salt Path, um, mm. which is about um, walking uh, like a a woman that walked the uh, south south coast path and that is an amazing book uh like the best hiking book that's come out for ages i think just so so powerful and emotive and the writing is 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 brilliant so that is definitely my my recommendation i love that i love that recommendation yeah the salt path um southwest coast path exactly touches on a lot of very very poignant messages for sure. So, oh, geez, I could yark on about that for a while. So next question. Yeah. Um, are you a morning or an evening person? Uh, evening person, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm really groggy and uh, pretty useless in the mornings. <laughs> what time does, does your day sort of tend to start? Um, I mean, when I'm at home, just usually like get to my laptop at like maybe nine uh or like but sometimes more like 10 but uh uh depending on how if i watch netflix while i'm having my cereal (laughs) (laughs) but on the train i seem to be if i'm out on an adventure i seem to be able to to wake up a a lot earlier but i don't don't enjoy it i need to Mm. get like a a coffee down me before i uh before i sort of get going properly so (laughs) brilliant okay next what question are you, what are, you like? are you good in the mornings oh, when you're i love up? the mornings trail, yeah you? generally speaking my ideal time to sort of start hiking is like half six um okay. but i quite like finishing early and that sort of yeah. is a bit of a barrier sometimes to while camping because you know you've got to or sometimes depending on where you are wait for it to start to get slightly darker or whatever yeah, and yeah. uh usually i'm like yeah i'm done by like five six ish. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no definitely mornings for me all right so question three is a bit of an odd one if you were reincarnated as an ice cream flavor what flavor would you be oh blimey um strawberry yeah strawberry is a good flavor um <laughs> i feel like i could have like a really good uh be able to provide you with why but now i, I don't really know <laughs> it's just that's what came to me just close to nature <laughs> oh, brilliant um, what did you want to be when you were growing up a uh, football player oh what team uh well I support west bromwich albion so um uh, and my whole family does so I obviously dreamed of uh wearing the uh blue and white jersey and uh playing at the hawthorns but um i've always loved football i still play football um but uh but yeah, I didn't obviously wasn't good enough. Uh, 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 but now, uh, now sometimes I joke that I became like a professional hiker, um, which uh, which like has um, effectively no money attached to it. But if I'd become a football player, obviously I'd be uh, driving a, a yellow Lamborghini and uh, <laughs> living in a mansion or whatever. So chose the wrong sport to be good at. <laughs> well, at least you're good at hiking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant um okay next question is what is your most unusual talent you, most unusual talent um uh oh blimey um what's an unusual talent um 
must have something. Oh, uh, it's not that unusual, but I'm really good at like spinning a like a basketball on my on my finger, huh. um, and then I can like do it with like one finger and then like transfer it to like all my different fingers. Ooh, so that <laughs> that's my party trick. <laughs> I like that. That's very cool. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. So next question. Who has inspired you most in your in your life? Um, who's inspired me mo- most in my life? Um, I mean, I think my I mean, everyone says this, like people that are really close to me, like my my grandparents, and my parents, and my, my family, like really, really kind of close to me and have inspired me um in terms of like more related to like the career that I've gone down and the the kind of other adventurers when I was sort of trying to to get into the adventure world and and kind of go on these big adventures it was people people that were quite prominent were people like Sean Conway, Alistair Humphreys, Anna McNuff um, they were the kind of people that I looked up to, saw had ma- managed to figure out a way to kind of live adventurously, go on big, big adventures and kind of make it work for them as the lifestyle. So um, and because they were kind of successful and doing really well, I kind of looked up to them and what they were doing and wanted to try and replicate that a little bit. So 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 those three guys, perhaps. Nice. I like that. Yeah, it's very, they're very inspirational figures, that's for sure. Um, I've just yeah. finished um, re-listening to Al Humphrey's sort of cycle around the world in his oh, yeah. multiple books. It's just so good. Just, when, when can we yeah. travel again? <laughs> they're all great. They're all great. I mean, Sean Conway's beard is just so oh, mesmerizing. It well. is. <laughs> <laughs> He's a character. <laughs> what a beard if exactly. only i could i mean i've got a bit of a stubble going on but i could never reach his the so well groomed like the just the, the quality of it if you if you ever get near to it i've because I, I know sean i've seen him quite many times and if you just if you're next to him you just want to stroke it that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> anyway sorry moving on from that <laughs> So good. Um, okay, when you're 80 years old, looking back on your life, what will matter to you most? Um, I think, I think definitely some of the big adventures that I've done. Um, I'm really what I want to achieve by the time I'm 80. Want to look back on is having done some really long trails. Like I think what I will look back on is if I've managed to have done like the PCT or Le Jog or um or or those sort of things that's what I'm kind of really inspired by and that's sort of maybe like my next level for me um over the next few years I'd, I'd love to do that um and and then I'm like really proud of like my book for example I guess one thing I want to say is that because I've got like because I use Instagram and um, being on Instagram loads, I think people kind of sometimes think, oh, like being getting followers or likes on Instagram is like really important. And like, I often just say like, it's literally, it's just all for like ego or it's just so, there's just no substance behind it at all. Like I know that when I'm 80, I'm not going to look back and think, oh, that post I put on Instagram was really good it's like completely pointless the whole thing is like what you're really going to look back on is the experiences you had the walks you did those moments when you're on top of the mountain or whatever and so kind of I think in this very kind of like social media obsessed world definitely when you're older it's not going to be looking back on uh you know kind of quite superficial things like social media I definitely think it's going to be those more genuine experiences and uh and I think it's trying to remember that in 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 everyday life as well is quite important so Mm, no I completely agree yeah a lot of truth behind that that's for sure all right um tricky one what's your favorite food favorite food um (laughs) can I say a few (laughs) yeah of course Um, you can (laughs) yeah um I love a curry. 
I do love a curry. I'm from Birmingham, so we've got like the best curries in the world in Birmingham. <laughs> so I'd say like curry, uh, pizza probably, and then I do love I do do love chocolate as well. Just like oh. any chocolate, any chocolate bar, pretty much. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I don't really tend to have like too many curries or pizzas when I'm on trail, but I'll just like be eating all the chocolate. <laughs> yeah whatever <laughs> good stuff okay penultimate question what is your favorite outdoor space uh, my favorite outdoor space um so i love the mountains i'm drawn to the mountains my favorite places generally are places that I have more of a kind of personal connection to for whatever reason so like the hills near to where I live and this part of the lakes I used to come as a child and, and kind of go on holiday. So I love the Northern Lake district. Um, and one place that I love is hill just near me, um, called Hope Gill head. Mm. And it, it's just on my close to my doorstep. You can see it from Cockermouth, the town where I live. And so it doesn't get applauded. It's, it's not it, never in the like list of the best, Lake District Hills but for me it's got this kind of personal quite kind of like intimate meaning and so if I'm just fancy a bit of space and time outdoors to clear my head I can I can go up there and just like I love the summit and the views that you get and I've been there loads of times after like a stressful day and just gone up in the evening just sat on the summit for 10 minutes and just enjoyed the kind of tranquility of it all and so for me it has this kind of like deeper meaning so Mm. so so that's how it that's why why I'd kind of choose that place and I guess that's what's great about the outdoors everyone can have their own kind of special places for whatever reason they choose really yeah no love it absolutely okay final question do you have any catchphrases or mantras that you live your life by um Not really, but um, like I don't, yeah, I don't have any sort of like mantras or or kind of like, yeah, specific catchphrases I tell myself while I'm looking in the mirror or whatever. But um, (laughs) (laughs) but, but like I do, I would say that I kind of, yeah, one thing that I do do is try and just like almost say just like go for it. like sometimes you just need to like take that leap of faith and uh, and and go for something and and not overthink it and a lot of the big adventures that I've done sometimes I've just like launched into it and you can really overthink things and and kind of like overplan them and mm. sometimes just like jumping into it and going for it is the is a kind of good strategy in life um and and kind of that can help you to kind of not get caught up in thinking about it too much and convincing yourself not to do it. So that would perhaps be my, perhaps be my, my kind of thought on that. Yeah. Solid advice. I like that. Well, listen, James, it's been so good to to have a chat with you today. Thank you for sharing so honestly, you know, your story and what sort of led you to and kept you heading outside. Um, I hope that we've left some viewers. Well, I'm sure actually that we've left some some listeners and viewers very inspired by by your story. So thanks for yeah, making sure. the time and hopefully see you on the ground in person very soon. Yeah, we'll have to go for a hike sometime. That'll be fun. We will bring it on. And I'm very happy to come to the Lake District. Any excuse. So you know. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> That's it. Brilliant. Well, you take care and we will speak again soon. Thanks, Abby. Take care. Cheers, James. Thanks so much for tuning into today's episode, guys. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation just as much as I did. James is an inspirational character. And if you'd like to find out more about his work, head to his Instagram platform, his website, and maybe pick up a copy of his book, The Mountain Man. Don't forget, if you'd like to connect with like-minded individuals, then join our online community at patreon.com forward slash spend more time in the wild. There really is something for everybody there, and you are absolutely welcome. See you soon, guys. And until then, stay wild.